So we now have questions and answers, but we have a very distinguished panel from the Brand Forum. And we can ask uh, John Armstrong, David Cotter, Conor Kilduff, and Camille O'Flanagan to come up, and also Paul. And just to introduce the panel that you haven't been, that some of you may not know, uh, John Armstrong from Keypack, one of the most successful export-led Irish uh, food brands. Rustler's uh, is now worth, uh, in, in the UK market, sales of over 140 million, and Rustler's is expected to be in the top 100 UK brands this year. So hugely successful example of, I suppose, the way we really all have to go. And Paul did allude to that in his speech. You know, we've got to sell a bit of Ireland around the world. If we want to be successful brands, we're going to have to export. Uh, David Cotter is familiar to you. If you, if he, he gave a, a, a very interesting paper to the Brown Forum recently. He is the country manager for Procter & Gamble. Um, almost 20 years of Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble people tend to be lifers, though. I've met a few of them. And David was appointed country manager in Ireland. He's responsible for the total commercial and marketing operations across all of their products, and they have a huge product range. Conor Kilduff, ex-Unilever. I knew Conor in Unilever, so, but he doesn't have to fight with uh, David tonight because, of course, he's in Keelings, uh, where he's sales, marketing, and technical director. And I think Keelings are an example to everybody who, you know, if, 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 if there was one market that people would have said could not be branded, it was fresh fruit and vegetables. And I think Keelings has done a brilliant job in that area. And finally, I should have said first, but we're going in alphabetical order, Camilo Flanagan, uh, marketing director of Barry's Tea, one of the most successful Irish brands. I just, you know, I think when Helen was going through the, the tea market, I don't think she gave a sufficient credit for the success of tea in withstanding retailer brands. Uh, in, is part of it is due to the fact that they're very heavy spenders on advertising, which is always a guaranteed method of keeping the retailers at bay. <laughs> However, that's just my bias. But they do very good advertising in Barry's. Um, no, I, I can't think of any other company who run a radio commercial who run it for the last 20 years, and we were just talking earlier, bring a tear to the eye of the entire country in the week that they run it before Christmas. So, any questions? You're gonna force me to ask a question. <laughs> oh, sorry, there's a hand. Oh, is that there? Are? Sorry. Lady in red. Um, before, uh, did you catch the start? Sorry, um, I'll repeat it again. Just from a discounter's perspective, what do you see to be the most valuable performance indicator? Um, well, it's, uh, it's always a combination. Um, first of all, the uh, product needs to meet some kind of need, and if the discounter's not meeting it properly uh, previous to that, instantly it's um, uh, going to be uh, interested in the item. So first of all, meet the need. Secondly, it's got to sell in volume. The discounter's not interested in some kind of uh, tail, fringy product where you can sell four or five units per store per week. Um, volume is, uh, is, is necessary. It wants a fast stock turn. One of the reasons why discounters are successful is they are uh, the supreme version of buy, sell, pay. They're good at paying, uh, they have a good reputation, but it is buy, sell, hold on to your money for a little bit, and a little bit, and a little bit, and then pay you. And uh, you can make money out of holding on to the supplier's money because that's your expansion uh, uh, business. A typical supermarket uh, can turn its stock over every 26, 27 days. Um, if it's got 35 days to um, uh, pay for it, it's got eight days of your money where it can uh, use that. A discounter wants to turn it over in 12 and still only pay you in 35 days. So now it's got 23 days. Uh, and uh, therefore you've got to have fast moving items. So bring it, fast moving items, bring it um, uh, a new customer need um, 
And actually, profit is not so critical. It's willing to live with less profit than the rest of the industry. Um, uh, those would be the criteria. Question down there, near the end. Hi, um, Maxine Hyde from Ballyhoolie Relish. Um, I was just a question for Paul and I suppose some of the rest of the panel. Um, you'll see on the market some private label products are clearly packaged the exact same way as the brand. And it uh, just makes it very easy for the customer to know that the, that the brand is making the, the private label. And I'm just wondering, is this a concern to the brand? And um, mm -hmm. how do they feel about it? And do they take any steps to differentiate you know, or make up for the price differentiation? <coughs> Um, well, actually a discounter, when it's uh, presenting its private label, uh, does get a little bit worried. I was a bit blasé when I said they don't care about intellectual property. What the discounter cares about is its reputation. Because if you think about it this way, uh, you can go into some pound shops on the high street and you can buy some Nike uh, um, socks, except it's spelled N-I-K the E's missing, or the tick's the wrong way round, or something is wrong, it's clearly not. It comes from some deepest, darkest China uh, factory and it, it's nothing to do with Nike or Adidas or, or whatever. Uh, and the discount is worried about getting that kind of, it's a fake reputation. So they've learnt over time not to copy to the extent where it's a, a fake. And, uh, they try to persuade branded players who are uh, going to supply them to make it different enough that the customer wouldn't recognise because otherwise maybe the brand is getting the, um, the benefit as opposed to the, um, uh, the, the retailer. Bottom line is, you, if you own a brand and you're proud of it, remember the old slogan which I, I always have in my mind, Kellogg's doesn't make cereals for anyone else. It used to be on the back of their trucks. Uh, then they caved in and went and did it, but th that's another matter. But that was a really smart move at the time. And if you're really strong and confident, uh, then, and you think your product cannot be copied, uh, and you're constantly innovating with it, then you shouldn't uh, compromise. Camille, would you like to comment on that from the various, a lot of people get close to the red. Yes. <laughs> but, um, it was a big issue for us over the last number of years when retailers were bringing out products and they were mimicking what our box looked like. So what we did was we, um, we actually refreshed the brand last year. It was part of an overall sort of deep dive on the brand to help defend against private label. And what we did was we set about creating um, a set of ownable brand assets that they couldn't copy but it also relates to the points made earlier is that we have a story to tell what do we do better than retailers and we need to tell tell that story and we would tell it through our packs so practical things we did is we um because we all know that um in terms of art well in terms of our brand it's the taste it's the heritage it's the quality it's the expertise so we did things like our brand mark we redrew it and we um we took inspiration from advertising from the 1930s we created a brand seal on the front of the pack that said family owned since 1901. We put gold bars on the pack, which sort of made the pack look a bit more premium and helped it stand out on shelf. And then what we did is with the rest of the pack, what we did was we told the unique story of Barry's in terms of its history and heritage. We did things like um, we, we used a spoon that our tea, our master blender uses every day that's been passed down through generations. We put a shot of that on the box. We put the scales he uses to weigh, which was Anthony Barry's scales. And we actually used um, a shot of, a sort of the original delivery bike that was used in, um, to deliver tea around Cork. And we've put a shot of, one of, of that on a box. And then what we did, which I think is important because people look at packaging, well, they definitely look at the front. I don't know how much they look at, at, at the rest of it. We did a campaign above the line then with outdoor and um, TV little ads that actually showed the spoon, showed the scales, had the quality mark on it. So what we were looking for is consistency and also to make the message stronger. And we'll actually continue to use all of those things over the coming years. Yeah, I, I mean, if you have a history at all, it's one of the most powerful weapons that you can use. 
And although Camille is very lucky in that the history is accurate, it's, all those stories are true, I think you're allowed a little bit of poetic license. Um, one of the most successful brands, nothing to do with this particular arena, is Moleskin. And they, they sell, they tell a story at the back of all of their little booklets, which is partly fictitious, I would have to say. There's enough truth in it to let them get away with it, but it is not all true. So you're allowed poetic light. Uh, poets are allowed it, I think, manufacturers, Irish manufacturers are allowed it. Actually, I did a little, it's not actually the original book. <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, sorry, sorry, David, yeah. Uh, John, I would, um, I would encourage people um, to find elements of the design that you can register and you can own as an intellectual property. Uh, and that you can protect that are core to um, the recognition of the brand uh, in, in store. Um, and so we do that a lot. Before we would launch any brand into a market, we would make sure that the design is already protected uh, before we launch it. And not just a specific design itself, but in, the general, how the, in general how the design is laid out on, on the pack. Um, and we will defend it. So I would encourage you, if you have a brand that you want to protect, to go and protect it and make sure it's registered. You can register trademark, you can trademark your design. I think while you're on that though, David, I mean, I've, there's been quite a lot of books that I've had to go through over the last couple of years written by either people who work for P&G or ex-P&G people. The attention to new product development and continuous incremental improvements is huge. Could you just tell us a little bit about how you approach that? Um, well, we have an organization structure that is split into uh, a number of different units. And so we have um, the selling market organization, and I belong to that now. Um, and I, um, I'm not involved in any of the innovation or upstream design. We have regional business units that commercialize in the regions what we're designing. And there's a global business team. And that global business team will work on near-in projects. And it will also be working on projects like the whiskey 18 years out. Um, um, and they do exist, those people, uh, who will actually try to design products that can be launched in the future. So we've actually got a very strongly resourced innovation, innovation pipeline. The upstream people, it's a difficult job. You're trying to identify where trends are, consumer trends are, where they might be um, in a number of years' time, and you're already designing your product and innovating against that trend um, uh, far out. Or you might be innovating in your production process. I remember uh, many years ago going to a production plant sorry, in an uh, in in innovation center, we were innovating on a production process. Um, and the idea was that you would be able to speed up the manufacturing line of a diaper, as we call them, diaper manufacturing line, and double it. Um, and I asked the guy what was involved, and he said probably about 10 years of development and about maybe half a billion dollars of capital will have to be spent to bring this to the marketplace. Um, but that's the level of investment we were prepared to make to get that advantage uh, in, in, in the future. So it's not necessarily, John, just about the, um, the brand or the product, but it can also be about the production process. Uh, yeah, no, I was thinking that book, Playing to Win, which describes the transformation of what I would have known as oil of Ule into Ule, is an extraordinary interesting case history for how to just transform a brand that was fading a little bit that had been around for a long time into a much more valuable brand for P&G. Yeah, yeah. um, sorry, John. The rustlers, the, your success must be attracting a lot of pressure now. You've just been so successful with that brand. Uh, yeah, I mean, from our point, the unlabel agenda for us is less about direct copycats coming from retailer side of things. Um, so we do play a kind of market protection game, a bit like the Weet Bix bit, in the sense that we would rather be in control of the market so we can control quality, and we can control the kind of uh, distribution side of things. Um, our own label agenda is more about, the context we sit in is in chilled convenience. That is a predominantly own label environment, ready meals, basically. So in somewhere like Tesco, it's 80% plus. So our primary challenge there is really about how do we fit into their agenda where their own label pipeline is huge so they, they were constantly churning and that means the buyer's mind is constantly on what's coming down the track so how do we fit our pipeline into theirs because theirs is is more disposable because they're willing to chuck stuff at the wall to some extent uh, and we have to be more considered and try and have fewer but bigger launches and 
playing into an environment where the buyer has maybe got a different attitude towards innovation, it's very important that we set out our stall in terms of what we're doing back to consumer needs, back to insight, all the points you, you made. You're Paul. doing exactly what Paul said <coughs> in really understanding the that. different retail. Yeah. And it, it, it's, you know, it is, we, we have to make that case very strongly to the retailer because they do have a different cycle, they do have a different agenda. So how we play our innovation into their agenda is, is set by that context. Yeah. Connor, you've done, you've done the impossible. You've created a brand where there was no brand before. Yeah, um, I guess I, I, our history is we are, we, we've always been growers. Yeah. So, so from the early 30s, we're now in the third, or the third generation of, of growing in St. Margaret's. So we, we, I guess we sold Keeling's fruit long before there were brands at all yeah. in fruit. And that developed then into a wholesale business in, in Dublin and then into serving the multiples. And we've become a known label service provider over many years. And then you sort of get to a place where you say, well, so what have we got that belongs to us that we can stand for? And in terms of a point of differentiation, well, we're growers. And when you meet the Keelings, if you get the, the pleasure to meet the Keelings, they're just growers. They talk about growing and they talk about product and they taste product. And when you're on a field with them, they eat product all the time. And they touch it and they smell it and they taste it and they talk about it. So we're growers and at our heart, that's what we do. So we're not retailers or we're, we're not really marketeers or salespeople, we're, we're, we're ultimately growers and that's where the brand comes from. So it's Keeling's love to grow and it's real and it's, it's very authentic. Um, I, I said to David one day, you know, I, I might not necessarily like to bring David to every customer we go to, but every single time I bring him to a farm, he's absolutely exceptional and you walk away feeling, my God, this man loves to grow. And that's where the brand comes from. So I guess we started because we did a little piece of research that said people would like to, to, to buy product from that authentic grower and know where it came from and know how it had been managed and touched and, and minded. Um, and we started. And a year and a half after we started, every retailer said, well, why do I need you? And what's your point of differentiation? And Sure, the same product is supplied in elsewhere. And it's been interesting for us because I guess it is authentic. It looks mm -hmm. really authentic. We were lucky to work with a designer who really got us from the very, very start. And I think the first interaction with that brand is when you pick it up and you look at it and it says you're a grower. Um, and it's interesting because we're sort of four years into the journey now and retailers don't ask me anymore about our point of differentiation and and we've 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 tried to develop those points of differentiation we 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 make sure that the product that is within is really really good um, but we we've also had the strength to put put a little piece of investment behind a belief oh. that that there's oh. a future here and and i think the investment in a way has been a big differentiator yeah. um, and, and I, I suppose if you talk to the family as a whole, what you'll hear, I guess, is sort of two doctrines, and, and both of which I think are very real and very right. Um, they love to grow. Um, they eat really well. Uh, they'd embarrass you about how well they eat. Um, I've lost weight since I went to Keeling's. I now train, and I, and I do things that I didn't do before I went, but um, I'm a healthier person uh, b because I'm there, but, but it, it, it sort of oozes out in people. Um, <clears throat> probably the healthiest thing we can do is go and eat really good food, but we don't. And one of the reasons we don't is because we don't market food. We don't market really good food. The next time you sit and you watch your television ad, because it sort of fascinated me because I've come from a branding background, yeah. but the next time you sit and you watch your television ad, you'll realize that most of the food that has been sold to you is not really, really good for you. In fact, it might not be good for you at all. And we operate in you know, poultry and veg and chicken and beef and whatever, but we operate without brands. So we don't tell a story. We don't tell a story about consumption. We don't tell a story about how good it's for you. We just don't drive it in that direction. And uh, from the day that we have done that, we have had significant category growth. So one of our stories to the retailer is you desperately need us. You desperately need us because you know price and we know product and we know quality. 
So in a way, that's our differentiator. Mm. So I can see a Harvard case history coming out of mm. Keelings before long. <laughs> yep, question there, just in the middle of the middle row. Uh, John Noonan from Flavins. Uh, just to thank Paul and Helen for two great presentations. I have a question for David, just around promotions. Um, we've seen promotionals uh, increasing over the, the past five years, often in response to private labour growth. Um, do you see particular advantages to putting your brands on promotion? Um, it's, a, it's a great question, thank you. Um, the um, there certainly has been an increase over the last five years in, um, in promotions. Um, and our brands have increased their promotion levels as well in order to uh, compete within that uh, environment. Uh, albeit, I will say that on average we promote less um, than our competition in the categories in which we play. And so I, I, um, I get a sense that there's a feeling that all promotions are bad and I don't subscribe to it. Um, and I think promotions have a role to play depending on where you are in terms of the category penetration and the category growth, um, uh, in, in terms of driving trial. Um, or um, it can have a role to play if you're, if you're seeking new users and you've got a new innovation that's coming. Um, I think there will be a move. I think there will be a shift in how we promote in Ireland across the next couple of years. Um, I see that already evolving. I think Aldi and Little have taught us that the consumer is very able to accept an everyday low price. Um, as long as the proposition is there, the quality is there, and the price value, the price quality relationship represents great value. And I think that's one of the ways that the, uh, the market, our industry, has evolved over the last uh, four to five years. And I think that we will see um, brands that have genuine points of difference that claim genuine point, the, the high ground in the categories in which they play, have products that deliver against the high ground uh, in the categories, in the high ground, I mean the need, the primary need, um, in the categories in which they play, and that are differentiated over time, you'll see that they will take a different um, approach to promoting their products. Um, in our categories, for example, um, we never promote blades. So Gillette blades are never on promotion. Venus blades are never on promotion. But if you swing to the absolute other end of, of the spectrum, uh, dishwasher tablets are never sold but on promotion. Right? So it's, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all. Um, we've launched a lot of innovation recently. Um, we've just launched a new Flexball uh, razor, and that's on half-price promotion uh, right now. Uh, in retailers to drive trial of that innovation. Of course, the blades that you will use with it will never be on promotion, uh, but we'd like to have as many handles as possible in people's uh, bathrooms to drive the blade consumption uh, of, the, of that format. Um, we've brought out um, a new product called Unstoppables, Lenore Unstoppables. It's beads that go into your, uh, your washing machine, and that's in its infancy. I think we've got about 4% uh, household penetration, probably about 6 to 7% category share. So it's got a huge amount of growth ahead of it, um, and that's about driving trial, and it will be about single unit price cuts to make sure that it's, it, it's, it's, it's a product that people experience. Um, so it depends on where you are in your category growth story, the expandability of the category, um, but also I think it depends on how the consumer, uh, it, we also need to reflect on how the consumer is changing, uh, how the shopper is changing, and, and trust in our brands a little bit more. Thanks. Sorry, there was a question before that. Hang on one minute. No, just behind there. Was there a question in the middle of the, yeah. Cheers. Hilary Hughes, Kerry Foods. A uh, question for John and Keepak. Um, like undoubtedly, it is brands that are bringing game-changing innovation to the market, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. And do you think it's going to switch over to the Weetabix model where literally brands are bringing innovation and handing it over to PL, or will PL just start innovating for themselves? Uh, well, in, in our broader category, private label has absolutely been the driver of innovation. So chilled ready meal pretty much doesn't exist without, there are almost no players, uh, certainly in the UK market, of any scale in that market. So that market was created by those guys. Um, within our own area, I think um, innovation is really, it's really important to your point about keep stepping the product on 
keep making that point of difference, keep making it difficult to copy and that is both a combination of product and obviously brand equity through advertising. Uh, and we need to keep moving that agenda on. Um, because if, if it does become too easy to copy, you become a commodity and then you're into a price war. So it's important that you balance that controlling the market piece with actively moving the market on. Two questions around here. Yep. Tom? Oh, sorry, there's one before you. <laughs> My next, okay. Uh, sorry, Paddy, Paddy Callaghan Paddy. from Nature's Best. Uh, just to echo John Noon and two great presentations from Helen and Paul, but Paul, a question for you. I think the discounters have been great for supporting and promoting Irish producers and Irish manufacturers. And I hope, I think I'm correct in saying that's probably helped grow the market share. But I wonder what that's like from a, a retailer's view of the world. And does it present opportunities for export to Aldi or does it limit opportunities or how does, that, uh, how does the future look in that respect? Um, I think that you should think about Aldi uh, or Lidl um, in a uh, uh, global sense. Uh, if I were a supplier which managed to find my way uh, to the shelf of uh, the Aldi or the, the Lidl business, I wouldn't be satisfied with just supplying their uh, Irish stores because that's 113 out of 9,000. I would think about how can I get that product. Even if I work out these guys do food themes uh, in their um, uh, special purchase area, this in-out uh, program. Um, discounters have a problem because they have no opportunity for promotion. Their whole business uh, for their core range is the same price every week. Why do they do that? Because they want absolute certainty. They want to know exactly what I'm going to sell in 16 weeks' time. Because if they can do that, they can keep their costs uh, at an absolute uh, uh, optimum level. Uh, and that's the reason why there's never any promotions. They want the lowest cost of production, distribution, logistics, everything. Uh, but they have to have some excitement in the store, and that excitement comes in this uh, central, bizarre kind of uh, uh, um, uh, area of the business, which was previously always non-food. Higher margin, interesting items. This area is getting attacked by the internet. It's a real problem for the discounters. They earn much less out of that area than they did 10 years ago, because the internet is now an alternative source of those products. So they're turning to uh, more food products because the food doesn't work on the internet. There's no money in online grocery. Nobody makes any money out of it. And uh, uh, therefore, there's an opportunity to replace these non-food items with food products. And how they're doing that is food themes. Everything from Italy for a week. Everything from Greece for a week. Why not everything from Ireland? And uh, if you play that out in uh, 6,000 German stores or... Uh, uh, 600 Austrian stores or um, uh, 500 Swiss stores, that's good business. That's what I'd be thinking about. I'm sure everybody's taking note of that. <laughs> Sorry about it. Tom, and then, and then over here. Sorry, Tom first there. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, Tom Kyo, Kyo's Crisps. Um, two questions, one for Connor and one for Camille. Connor, I promise they get you a tough question. <laughs> um, you're Kyo's just jealous because you're another North Dublin <laughs> grower. <laughs> well, that was my point. Uh, Kyo's and Keelan's, very, very similar brands. Mm -hmm. North County, Dublin, lots of problems, <laughs> multi-generations. Um, the fact of the matter is that stuff that we're doing is pretty much now being done everywhere. Um, you know, we were the first people to put an image of a farmer on a bag of potatoes. You guys have done lots of similar stuff in, 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 mm -hmm. in uh, fruit and veg. Now when you walk into a supermarket, the first thing you're, you encounter is a picture of a farmer. It's on every single bag, it's everywhere. People are really pushing pseudo provenance down, down consumers' throats. How do you see yourselves counteracting that in the future? Because that is your point of difference. Good question. <laughs> um, we, we, we did a piece of work 
uh, about a year ago to try to understand It, and I, it was in a particular retailer, but, but should, should, should the retailer have its own brand or should it have Keelings or should it have, you know, a mix of both or what should it do? And, and one of the pieces of research was to describe, you know, the strengths of the retailer and the weaknesses of the retailer. And similarly, the strengths of the Keelings brand and the weaknesses of the Keelings brand. And the strengths of the retailer, when I, when I sat and read the strengths, uh, I found it very insightful. The strengths were you have large car parks, your aisles are wide, you have a massive choice, your tills are uh, plenty, you're open on time, blah, 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 and so it went. And, and the insight, my view on that was, the consumer has just described a retailer. They have said, the good thing about you is you're a good retailer. And and then described Keelings, and it said, well, you're a grower, uh, provenance, Irishness, high quality, blah, blah, blah. And it described the brand, and it described what the brand stood for. And so, to my mind, it had, it had described, you're a retailer, and you're a brand, and you are not the same, and you can't be the same, and no matter what you try to do to, to try to own, I'm close to growers, or I know more than growers, or all of that stuff, I actually don't believe you. And the reason I don't believe you is you can't be that good at everything. You're a very good retailer, but ultimately I'm smart enough or I'm savvy enough to know, well, you probably don't know as much about that product or that category as that person. So I, I, I think retailers will continue to do provenance, and they should, and I think it's good for us, and it's good for particularly Irish growers and, and that industry, but ultimately they won't quell the, the requirement or the need for a little bit more knowledge about exactly where did that come from, and what trust can I have in that brand? And I, I don't think that'll, that'll, I, I don't think they can win that battle. Very yeah. good. Second question for Camille. Um, Barry's tea is now available in Aldi. Yes. Has that cannibalized your sales? No, it hasn't. At all? No, well, what happened was we, we started to, we were listed in Aldi in January, February of this year, and they get, we got listings in half of their stores as a trial. Um, and what, they, what happened was is that our main seller, Gold 80s, is put alongside McGrath's um, and sales were coming through steadily. Um, and then after it, because it was working, they sp we got listings with the rest of their stores. Um, so our sales have grown cons cons consistently since January, February. We definitely have seen cannibalization from some of the other multiples because you know, if Mrs. Murphy is shopping in Super Value and Tesco and Dunn's and Aldi before she could only get Barry's tea in her Super Value store where now she can get it in Aldi. So there's definitely been some cannibalization, but overall in terms for the brand, it's actually been, there has been net new sales from it because we weren't available in the discounter. So it's almost like you weren't, we weren't able to compete and now we can compete. And there seems to be a role for both. You know, they've got McGrath's 159 for 80 tea bags where they've got Barry's Gold, 359 for 80 tea bags, and there seems to be a role for both within their stores. And when you say you couldn't compete, what, what could you not compete on? We weren't available, so in terms of from, from a consumer, um, we just weren't available when they were doing, if they were going to three or four shops in a week, one of the shops they were going to didn't have tea, which is the discounters. So now, rather than wait, you know, they obviously might have picked up, actually Lyons is in, um, in Lidl, and so they were probably buying lines, and if they were in Little, they were, if they wanted a brand of tea, they were buying in Little, but they weren't able to buy us. So now they're picking up their box of tea in Aldi. And actually, it's, it's, it's really interesting, the sales are consistent, the way you talk about them being efficient. The sales come in every, at the same time, all the time, the same sales consistently. I can see, the, we can see the efficiency with it. Um, so, and we're seeing people say, oh, your product is available in Aldi. Um, so it has helped the brand and also it's people see the brand um, in a place where they weren't expecting it so it helps the brand appear more modern and contemporary as well because we all know the discounters are on the rise. Thanks John. I mean just to add to the, your question, sorry Connor, your question to Connor and Connor's answer in terms of the number of retailers who are now pushing farmers at every sort of you know at every point in the store 
I go back to Paul's point, consumers are quite smart in the end. They'll spot what is a genuine grower and what is an attempt by a retailer to make a point. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that'll, that in time, I suspect that'll, that'll, that'll go, that whole use of the, the farmers and the people who are genuine farmers will be left with that particular product, with that communication advantage. Now, is that, hang on, wait till that, yeah. Mike Carroll from Goldsbridge Trout Farm. First of all, um, Tom, I'd like to say that nobody could, could replace your lovely mug on the back of a... <laughs> 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 um, yeah, just, uh, I suppose, you know, we're, we're a young company in terms of our, our branding. We're just about to launch a new brand, and we're certainly someone very unique. And my picture's on my, pa on my packet as well. And uh, there's only one fishwife in this country. But <laughs> in terms, I suppose my dilemma is, um, I'm getting a lot of interest from the retailers, from Lidl, from like a super value, super, uh, done stores. They're talking about two things. First of all, own brand. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and the dilemma is, do you try and attempt to do business along that route and not to try and promote your brand? The second thing is, if you do business, a very practical question, if you do business with a uh, discounter, they're obviously going to approach 25% of the market share. And if you sell in the, re in the discounter, you're going to get market penetration and ultimately it's about profit and it's about owning your brand but also about profit selling your product. The problem um, we're faced is if we start selling our product in the, in the discounter they take a very small margin compared to the other retailers. So if you sell your, pro your product in, a, in the discounter and uh, the product will be available at a cheaper price than the other, the, the other retailers. So in other words if I go into Aldi my product will be cheaper than if I go into Tesco done stores because they will take a bigger um, market share. So people will ultimately, if you do business with this country, you can't do business with the retailer, the other retailers. So what's, that's the dilemma I suppose we're facing. Paul, I think that might be for you. I'm not sure that that's uh, a quite the right way to think, uh, to be honest. Um, I think that uh, uh, what you have to do is you have to have a strategy which covers the whole market of which you know that a quarter of it will be the discounters. Now, if you're a, the kind of product where you think actually the best thing to do is to leave that quarter out and concentrate on the other three quarters, I think that's perfectly okay. If it's part of your strategy and it's well thought through and there's a good reason for it. Or you can do it different and that is that you can say I will sell to the discounter a different pack size, uh, something which suits their model, uh, gives them the uh, efficiencies that they're looking for, maybe it's a slightly bigger pack, um, uh, and uh, that will be my discount offer. And then I will sell something quite different to the full line uh, uh, operators who will charge a little bit more because they've got higher costs. And uh, uh, so my point is you've got to work out uh, how to m approach this uh, market. And um, uh, there's plenty of examples. I think actually Coke is a very good one. Um, you can buy uh, a certain size of Coke bottle only in discounters. Uh, it's a little bit more than the perfect pack size in terms of the most uh, um, uh, pu purchased one. Um, it gives the discounter a little bit of a price advantage because you're buying a bigger pack and you'd expect that as a consumer. And that product is just for the discounters. They don't allow it into uh, the full line supermarkets. And the one and two litre product uh, goes into the supermarkets. And that's pretty smart, I think. That's pretty smart. And I, would, I, I wouldn't say it's always about pack sizes. Think about things you can do which mean that you separate it a little bit and it's a, a slightly differentiated offer. Thanks, Paul. Is there Both any more? with your uh, face on the back. <laughs> One here, second row. And just we ha we do have time for more questions. So I'd hate anybody to go home tonight thinking, God, if I'd only asked that question. You won't. I mean, this is about the most important issue facing all of us uh, in the trade. So if and you're not going to get a more knowledgeable panel together for a long time than we have tonight. So if you have a question. Get it ready. There's quite one here now. Thanks. Uh, question for Camille and Barry's Tea. Uh, firstly, I'm a fan. 
I drink tea every day. Thanks very much. Um, so Barry's has done an awful lot to protect their market leading position. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about your strategy in doing so. Okay, well, um, well first of all, the, we have a North Star for the brand and we're constantly orientating ourselves towards that mission. So the brand is always evolving every year. Now, I suppose we do have an advantage. All I have to think about all day is tea and lots of it and how to do it better and how to move it forward. So we're constantly evolving. Um, and then in the, the last number of years, there would have been three of the re retailers would have targeted the tea category um, in terms of private label. And they, the three of them actually had ads um, on TV um, trying to take the credentials of the brand. So what we did, and it wasn't because of what they were doing, they did what they were doing, because we also do follow our own path at times. We don't try and be distracted by what other people are doing. But what we did then was we actually, the emotional attachment to the brand, we actually dialed that up more. And Helen spoke about it earlier, you know, there's the rational aspects to a brand and there's the emotional aspects to the brand. So um, the emotional ones, actually Phil O'Leary, who's a, a very astute researcher, talks about if you see something, do you get a tug to the heart? Um, so we brought, we've had a new ad out in November and it's all about the emotional side of tea. So it's about a granddaughter and a grandmother who, um, have, very, have a relationship, they both are very different people, but it's tea that brings them together. So we push that door all of the time. Also, we're um, innovating more. It's difficult to innovate in tea, but we're trying to innovate a bit more. Something we would have brought out at Christmas was like a master blend tin, which also speaks to our heritage cues, which also speaks to premiumness. So we're trying to make sure that all of our messaging is consistent. Um, that's, so we're going to continue to innovate. Um, now, they won't give us big volume, um, but what they do is give a halo effect on the brand and then um, another important word that we talk about all of the time is loyalty and um, loyal consumers. So when we talk about our plans, we say, OK, are our plans, do they talk to our loyal consumers? Or are we going to hold them? Um, and we've done things like, f you know, buy a box of gold 80s, get a nice free caddy. So we're doing initiatives just for loyalty. And actually, we're trying to control our amount of product on discount because um, actually the category isn't expandable. So if you buy loads of tea, you're not going to use it all in one week. It'll, you'll, st you'll still have tea in the press for another month. So we're quite clear about what we're doing. I see David nodding his head vigorously there. Do you want to <laughs> <laughs> confirm? No, I was, I was agreeing. With, actually, I was listening and agreeing with a lot of what was being said <laughs> in terms of great brand management and ensuring that uh, there's a very strong equity around that brand. Um, and being from Cork, of course, I absolutely adore <laughs> Barry's tea. Um, but uh, yeah, and all of the activities that are taking place and what I was nodding vigorously at at the end was not relying on price discount to actually yeah, drive yeah. the volume, but actually having consumer demand. I think as Paul was referring to earlier, you become a lot more valuable to discounters or to any retailer, frankly, if you bring a lot of value to the table, right? And you have something valuable to trade. Well, I um, think a key point that, sorry, of what, Camille is saying is, it's the emotional connection that's yeah. critical. I noticed there recently in a book, John Hegarty, the famous creative director from London, Sir John Hegarty now, uh, and he made the point, the, uh, did I get this one right? The heart feels today what the head understands tomorrow. So it's heart first, all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, another question. Yeah, back row, Jackie. Second from back row. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Jackie Marsh from the Butler's Pantry. If I could just ask a quick question about the example that was shown earlier, which was a super value own label product where they promoted the, the brand owner on the front. So you had the made by Folan in West Cork. Uh, and the question to the panel, do you see that as being a trend which own label will follow, where they will very much bring the, the brand owner to the fore of the, uh, of the brand? I think they're trying to do that. It's whether the brand owner will um, allow it to happen. Yeah, it feels like grand suicide to me. Yeah. Paul? It's very desirable by the discounters. <laughs> very desirable. <laughs> <laughs> but there. think about it. Um, if you've made the decision that you're going to stock that product uh, uh, in the discount channel, um, then you have the real worry that because they own the brand, this private label, 
McGrath's or whatever, you're exchangeable. If somebody else comes and says, I can make that tea, uh, and I don't mind it being McGrath's, um, uh, and I can make it cheaper, the discounter will be listening. And he may partition the quantity to see how it goes and make sure that this uh, uh, account uh, isn't damaged by uh, having a different supplier. If your name is on it, or maybe if you own it, but you only sell it in Aldi, he can't do anything else. Then he would have to completely exchange the product. So it's not so bad. I wouldn't say it's brand suicide if you've made the decision that you want to be uh, in that channel. And don't forget, that channel could be worth, um, uh, we saw there, 10 to 12 percent. But then maybe you need another strategy for uh, your other um, uh, customers because, um, yeah, you, you've, you've put a picture. Actually, I'm not sure the picture is the right thing, but maybe owning or co-owning the brand is quite a smart thing to do from the supplier's point of view, because you're not so exchangeable then. Do you want to comment on that, Connor? I suppose I'd come at it from two, two, two ways I'd come at it, and I, I'll, I'll talk on behalf of Keelings. Um, we've been asked, <laughs> um, but it's not something we would do. And, and very simply, for I think when you, when you get into the, into the head of, of your customer, Actually, you can often be in a particular customer and it's actually the right decision, if, if you're with me. The intent is real, it's the right decision for the customer, and it might well be the right strategy for that particular customer. And, and it might be the thing for the long term, exactly as you've said, Paul. The, the problem is more around, well, how would that affect my relationship with every other customer? And, and in the case of, of the Keelings brand, eventually it does away with the brand, because why would you have the brand if you've got something that says, you know, from the makers of Keelings. I, I think there's a different potential there in the, in the own label uh, arena, which is co-creation. And, and there's a lot of companies do it very well. Kerry does it particularly well in terms of the co-creation of a brand, which is wholly owned, uh, wholly owned by a, by, a, by a manufacturer, but it is exclusive to a particular retailer. Um, and, and there's a lot of people doing very well in that, in that arena. And I, and I think that's something that you can, you can do and think about. But I suppose for me, it wouldn't be the use yeah. of the brand We itself. did have a presentation from Kerry about a year ago on, on, on one of the brands that they're doing yeah. that within the UK. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. No, near the back. Hi, Brendan Nolan from Manor Farm Chicken. It's great to hear a lot of the panel there talking about uh, family and history and tradition because uh, we're trying to relaunch a brand of chicken from a company which is now 240 years old. So it's, it's, it's good, it's good uh, influence for us. I have a question for Paul there. Could you tell me what's the attitude of the discounters to sustainability? Yeah, um, that's a, a very good question and it's on the topic of um, uh, pretty much every retailer, including the, um, uh, the discounters. Um, I think you need to understand why. It's fear that drives uh, sustainability onto the agenda of the discounters. Um, fear that uh, uh, some kind of bad PR would damage their brand and their business. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very hot topic and um, uh, the uh, efforts and money spent on making sure that they cannot get themselves into a, a, a problem is equivalent to any of the big brands um, uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Um, and it's largely to do with uh, uh, fear. Interesting. Yep. think the competitive response will be for more everyday retailers uh, in, to that? Do you, do you see them reducing SKUs, for example? Um, I think that um, uh, there is a process of range rationalisation that normally takes place while the industry is adjusting to these new uh, sets of circumstances. Um, 
the new circumstances are discounting comes from nothing in uh, 1995 to suddenly owning a quarter of the, of, of the market. And uh, everybody's got to get it used to that. Uh, they take cost out to get that price gap uh, flattened. And one of the ways of taking price out is the retailer invites its four suppliers in one category and tells them, uh, today is a beauty parade. We only need three of you. Uh, now, uh, help us decide which one we don't need. And um, it's a typical tactic of, uh, uh, of the retailer um, uh, to try to use that as a negotiation tactic to get prices lower, um, uh, to give a bit more room on the shelf to three brands instead of uh, previously there were four. Uh, the rules haven't really changed from what we said uh, a little bit earlier. If the retailer needs you, because you have something unique and special which um, your competitors don't have, then he's much less likely to uh, uh, let you be the, the one out of the four that's uh, gone. I tried uh, at the end of the presentation to make a point about personality with that picture of Guinness, but actually Connor made a, the point much better than I uh, did. If you've got something which um, you really can tell the retailer, you need me because I have something no one else has, uh, you're in. You're in and you're in for life. Very back, David, very back of the hall, standing up. Sorry, the gallery. Sorry, uh, Keith Johnson from Sam's Cookies. Where do you see the future with e-tendering? Paul. Paul. Uh, it scares the hell out of me, to be honest, uh, uh, e-tendering, because um, I've seen it in a number of other industries uh, where a buyer who's 27 years old has never used a diaper in his life uh, is making some kind of algorithm up that's going to make the decision which is the right product to buy and he's going to get it wrong. Uh, you need to have a feel for the product and, okay, gathering the information is one thing, but if you don't understand the product, you will end up with a, a crappy range that the customer won't understand and uh, you'll lose business to the next retailer. So, uh, I think it'll be a typical scenario that uh, a retailer will take it on board. Uh, we'll see, ah, I can get rid of... 10% of my buying force by using this um, uh, process. I get rid of 10% uh, and I find at the same time I got rid of 10% of my sales uh, because I made poorer decisions. So it's here and it's here to stay but it's being a little bit overblown in terms of how important it is uh, uh, right now. Okay. Dave. The mic is coming down just there beside you. Hi, David Phelan, Steering Group. I just wanted to ask you, Paul, what's your view of uh, the tactical use occasionally of, of brands? Uh, you know, when you can't get brands, you mentioned the, the Kit Kat brand there. Uh, but, but when the discounters can't get brands they really want, uh, what's your view in, in your perspective on the strategy and what they're thinking there and how they go about it? Well, uh, the the, um, the retailer, the discounter, are totally focused on themselves. So everything they do is to make their business uh, more successful. Don't think for a minute they're caring about yours. Uh, you're just a route to being successful. So what you have to do is um, uh, to understand that they are a route to market uh, uh, for you and um, uh, to try to get inside their head. In the case of the Kit Kat uh, story, um, it's still the case today, you cannot make a really good copy of uh, Kit Kat. And I think Nestle should have been much more confident about that right from day one to say, look, try as hard as you might. We know because of how hard it is to develop that product. Uh, you'll never get as good a product as this. So, come on, let's sit down. We'll do a pack uh, uh, for you. Uh, you'll make reasonable money out of it and you have much bigger fish to fry copying McVitie's biscuits or uh, some other uh, product. Um, 
it's just really about understanding your position in the market. Uh, and Paul, sorry to draw. What brands do you think? What brands that you know in your experience are doing a really good job uh, with the discounters? I mean, you mentioned Barry's Coke. Tea. Barry's Tea. Is doing <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, really, it's yeah. a it's a super product, and um, uh, uh, the <coughs> the one discounter now has an advantage over the other discounter because that's also important to them because they have a iconic product on their shelves. Uh, this product is better than uh, the private label uh, product because it understands the water that gets put, uh, poured into it much better than uh, uh, anybody else. And it does have an emotional uh, attachment. When there was a crisis in my family, the, my grandmother said, I'll make a cup of tea. That's, that's actually what happened. And somehow it all was a little bit easier. Don't ask me how to explain that, but that is that emotional uh, uh, point on that product. Coke does a good job. You can copy Coke. This idea it's a secret formula, it's all crap. It's uh, easy to copy. What you can't copy is the billions that they put into uh, the marketing of that product that somehow it brings some sunshine into your life. On that note, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for bringing, <laughs> bringing sunshine. <laughs>